Oh, there's just one chapter. That's right. There's just one chapter, so don't waste your time looking for the second. You there? Jude, the half brother of Jesus, wrote this letter about thirty years after the death of his his half brother. If you follow the writings of Jude, Timothy, and some of Peter, you find that they cover a lot of the same issues in this, that they were warning the church of things that were to come. Not prophetic things such as this is going to happen and that's going to happen, but he was, they were warning the church as to what was happening then and there, and then prophetically speaking to the church of today. I believe that the church has had to walk through deep water ever since its inception. Would you agree with that? That ever since the church was birthed, there have been men and women, there have been those sent by our enemy to bring confusion and disturbance. It has always been that way. It will always be that way until we are delivered from this particular planet. Jude wanted to, to write to the church and really give them an encouraging word regarding their salvation, a salvation that is common to all men and women of the family of God. But something stirred him. He said, and, and I'm going to put this in Redmondisms, I wanted to write to you regarding salvation, but there is something more pressing in me that I have to share with you. That may be, and I haven't read it in the newer translations, but that may be pretty close to what some of our modern day language translations would say. For example, in, in the first verse of Jude, in the King James, it says it like this, Jude, the servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to them that are sanctified by God the Father and preserved in Jesus Christ and called mercy, Unto you and peace, love be multiplied. Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. Now right there, if you read between the lines and you begin to dissect uh, what Jude is trying to say... Uh, I want to write to you, I started to write to you, I had all intentions of, and I was giving due diligence to write unto you about the common salvation. But he goes on to say that there is something pressing me to tell you to contend for the faith. Now, what does the word contend imply to you? Some kind of a fight? A battle of sorts? Pardon? And a choice. A choice? Opposition. There is something coming your way that will make your salvation something to fight for. We all understand what that salvation is. We understand where it came from. We understand how we received it. It came through the grace and the mercy of Jesus Christ. That was a free gift. But once we receive that salvation, there is a battle that lies ahead of us. And Jude said, you're going to have to fight for it. You can't just say, I'm saved, sit down, and leave it alone. There is some contending to be done. Now as I said a moment ago, he was speaking to the church of that day. He and Timothy and Peter all understood that. That they, they were called uh, men who slip in unaware. Hiding who they really are. 
wolves in sheep's clothing coming in among the church. And Jude was saying, watch out for this. He went on to say, for there are certain men, there it is, crept in unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation. They are ungodly men. They turn the grace of our God into lasciviousness. Denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. I will, Jude said, I will therefore put you in remembrance, though you once knew this, how that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed them that believed not. And he goes on and gives a great exhortation. I want to skip down a couple verses, perhaps to verse uh, 17. But beloved, remember ye the words which were spoken before the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. How that they told you there should be mockers in the last time. Who would walk after their own ungodly lusts. These be they who separate themselves. They are sensual. And they do not have the Spirit of God. But you, beloved, building up yourselves on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost, keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal Life. Father, now bless the reading of your word. For the next few moments, please help me to communicate in an effective way. Help me, Father, to surrender my lips to you and let your words flow through me. Father, let me reach one person. Of this whole crowd, if I can reach one person, Lord, I will feel successful today. Give me one. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name. So Jude finishes in a very short way his description of what is going to happen in the church and those that have already slipped in, those who are trying to bring destruction and confusion to the house of God. Then he comes down to the verse that says, but you... You know. You keep yourselves in the love of God. And you build yourselves up. You edify. You strengthen your lives by praying in the Holy Ghost. There is one thing you cannot stop a Christian from doing who is praying in the Holy Ghost. You cannot keep a spirit-filled believer immature. It's impossible. When you are ab abiding by the Word, when you are obeying the Word, and you are praying in the Spirit, it is a given that you are edifying yourself and that you are building yourself up, i.e., you are maturing in God when you are praying the will of the Father in the Spirit of God. Now don't everybody in here turn Dick Tracy on me. Or Mickey Spillane. Remember those guys? Detectives? Because I'm going to say something here. And if you're not careful, you're going to become a Dick Tracy or a Mickey Spillane. When you see someone who is not growing and maturing in God, you are seeing someone who is not praying in the Spirit. <clears throat> Now I just look, I have to let that sink into you. How many how many of you understand right now that uh, I'm not I'm not Calvinist? 
Does that, did that dawn on you? I am not of a Calvinist persuasion. I am Armenian. Coming from Armenius. In other words, I believe in praying in tongues. And I believe that the more I pray in the Spirit, the stronger my spirit becomes. Amen. And when I am being strengthened in God, I am maturing in Jesus. Now, I have seen things in the Pentecostal church that are really disgusting. People who just go... Uh, my terminology, i got to watch my terminology. I heard the preacher last night use some terms that, I would, that I've never used. I said, whoops. I'm not even going to go there. To build. To build. Building up yourselves in your most... Holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. The word there, building, and we're going to see it in just a few moments, is in, an, in another text using the word edifying. See, the word building in the Jude passage can also be translated edifying. Edifying yourselves in your most holy faith. Building up yourselves in your most holy faith is in the present participle form of the verb. To build. Which means that it is, it is not, not being in the aorist tense, but in the present tense. It's not a one-time occasion. Well, I prayed in the Holy Spirit about 23 years ago. Are you filled with the Spirit? Yeah. When's the last time you prayed in the Spirit? Oh, about 23 years ago. Maybe longer. Can't remember. That type of infilling of the Spirit, that type of praying in the Spirit would be noted as the aorist tense in the Greek. It is a one-time event. But building is in the present participle tense. That means in the future, do it and keep on doing it. Build and keep on building up yourselves. Keep on edifying yourself in God by praying in the Spirit. I uh, want to talk now for just a few moments about this maturing thing. Growing up in God. What should come from a life that is mature in God? First of all, I believe it should be fruitful. Amen. Paul said it like this to the church, his second letter to Corinth. Now he that ministereth seed to the sower, both minister bread for your food and multiply your seed sown, and increase the fruits of your righteousness. Did y'all, did you follow in the way in which I just drifted? Are you still with me? Every one of us who are maturing in God must show that maturity and fruitfulness. When someone ministers to us, they are planting the seed. They are giving us bread to eat, but they are also planting in us something that we might sow. Oh, I need to read that again. Now he that ministereth, that's the ministerer, the person doing the ministry, right? Now he that ministereth Seed to the sower. Both minister bread for your food and 
multiply the seed. If you never put a kernel of corn in the ground, you will never have another cob. Isn't that simple? Never put another wheat seed in the ground and wheat fields will disappear. The wheat gives you bread, but you take the kernel and you replant it. So it is a constant giving and growing, giving and growing, giving and growing. And when God is ministering to us seed, He's not only feeding our spirit, He is giving us something to plant in somebody else. Amen. It's not just for me. Oh, it feels good, sounds good, but it's not just for me. Now I want you to say that in your own mind. What God does for me is not just for me. Oh, I understand that you're at a very specific need. You're at a, a point in your life. You're at a time in your life that God has to do something and He shows up and He does it. But ladies and gentlemen, that, that moment, that instantaneous moment that He does it may meet your need, but it is planting seed for somebody tomorrow that needs it. I would have never dreamt, never, never, never dreamt in a million years that after I went through my bout of suicide attempt and all that garbage a number of years ago, that I would, that God could ever use that experience to help somebody else. Listen, if you've never been there, it's a place you don't want to go. I, I won't give you the whole testimony, but I, I, I was in a place that I, I was there. I was prepared. I knew exactly what was going to happen. And in a desperate moment, I cried out to God, God, I don't want to die, but I don't know what else to do. Like I say, I won't go through the whole testimony, but God delivered me out of that very moment, and it wasn't, it wasn't but a short time later. Now you understand that I was a minister. I was a preacher of the gospel when I went through that. We are not immune to the attacks of the enemy. I put my pants on just like the rest of you men do. Does that disappoint someone? <laughs> I don't get up in the morning and just, I'm, I'm so full of the glory of God that the clothes jump out of the closet and onto my body. And I don't wake up, I don't wake up with a glow that covers my nakedness. I gotta put some clothes on. So I'm just like you. No S. If anybody should know, she should know. But we are we we preachers. I, I know a lot of them like to hold themselves in high esteem. I don't even like to stand up and say I'm a preacher in a public service. <laughs> Would all the pastors stand up? I don't have to stand up. I know who I am. I saw your wife tap you on the knee last night. You know what she said to me? Yeah, she went like that and she said, don't embarrass me. <laughs> okay, so I stood up. Everybody can see I'm a pastor. I was... <laughs> but there I was, and God delivered me out of that specific moment, that time of great need in my life. 
He delivered me. Did you know that while I was going through that, I wasn't thinking, I can use this down the road. There wasn't going to be no road. I had no road to look down. So it was that moment. God seated me. Seated me with new hope. A few months later, I was in the pulpit as a guest speaker. I was as an evangelist speaking to a, a church full of folk and right up on the first couple rows were the young folk, the, the youth that gathered from various churches I was ministering. And very embarrassingly, I began to share my testimony. And it wasn't even my message. I just began to share what I had gone through. And I noticed a couple little girls on the road with those Jews began to weep. Afterward, I found out that there were three teenagers sitting over there that just that very week had contemplated suicide. And so I was able to minister hope. See, God seated hope in me. He seated a new kind of faith in me. And it was bread to me. I... I devoured it, but it wasn't for me only. It's to plant the seed in somebody else. And if you're here today, I want to tell you there's hope you may not think there is. You may be at a time of your life, something is going on that you see no answer to. There's no road in the future for you, but I'm telling you, there's hope. <laughs> And I want to plant that seed in you. There's hope. Yes. That seed of hope. I'm probably not going to get any further in this message. But that seed of hope means so much to me. And I think about it constantly. What God did for me. Remember a few years ago. Well, it's, it's more than when you get old, everything is a few years ago. <laughs> it's really probably a long time ago. Y'all will correct me, but remember a few years ago when there was a young rock and roll singer by the name of Ozzy Osbourne? No, that's more than a few years. How long? That, well, if Robert Clack remembers it, you know it's a long time ago. <laughs> Very long time ago. <laughs> Remember that there was that one incident when he bit the head off of a bat in a public, uh, what do you call concert. Man was evil. You could, when he was a young man, you could just see the evil in him. And he bit the head off of a bat in a public concert. And they showed the pictures of it and blood running down. It was, it was quite the thing. And preachers, being preachers, took their pulpits and began to rip that young man. Now, it was a very evil thing, and he was a very evil person, and to this day, I don't think he has yet met the Lord. So I'm not discounting the wickedness of the act, and all the preachers began to tell how wicked it, it just, if he was there, they would have crucified him. And the Lord spoke to my heart, and when I took the pulpit to preach on some issues, there was a compassion that went out of me because I knew that even for an Ozzy Osbourne, there was hope. Amen. 
As long as a person is drawing breath and walking on top of terra firma, there is hope. There is a God that I know and a Jesus that's a part of my life that says in any situation, there's hope. Amen. So I, I didn't preach Ozzy Osbourne into hell. I preached into hope. And I prayed for him. In fact, he and his, his wife, is it Janet? What's her name? Sharon. 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 They had a, a program and that, that may still be on television in syndication, which they, they would go in, the, the cameras would go into Ozzy Osbourne's home and, and just follow the life of his family. How many of you saw that? Now, I'm not encouraging you to go watch that, but I watched it because when I saw, even as an old man, but hardly understanding when he speaks and dark rings under his eyes and wrinkles in his face and very sickly in body, but I would see him and there was something, something would come up in me even now. I see there's hope. God save Ozzy Osbourne. Yeah. And I could, I could say that for for every wicked rock and roll singer. Who's, who's Robert, you know, uh, the Jewish guy? Neil uh, Diamond? The, the, the another Jewish guy. But they're all Jews, aren't they? Uh, most of them are. Guys that used to dress up and kiss. Gene Simmons. Gene Simmons. Yeah, no, you old people just caught that. Gene Simmons, you know. They came on with a, a series called The Family Jewels about Gene Simmons and his family. And all, every time I, I didn't watch it on a habitual basis because it, it, I just don't do that, but I would see Gene Simmons and I knew he's a Jew and I'd say, God save him. There's hope. And when he went to the graveside of his father in Israel, I saw a sight of Gene Simmons that I've never seen. As he stood there at the graveside of his daddy, he began to weep. Tears coming down his cheeks. He's not just a big name singer with kiss. He is a created being by the God that created you and me. And the hand of salvation, the hand of grace and mercy are extended to him just as they were to us. I can't see anybody like that. You know who I prayed for until they die? <coughs> Johnny Carson. Every time I saw Johnny Carson, I was like, boy, what could he do in the church? How could he touch lives in the church? I, I prayed for Johnny. There's a, a professional guitarist, a jazz guitarist that my wife had a dream of or about. What was his? Uh, Eric Clapton. Yeah, Yeah, didn't even hear, didn't even know Barry Clapton, but she had a dream about him and woke up and said, Do you know this? I bet he got saved. He did. And I thought, yeah, after, Eric got saved? Yes, he did. After I dream about Shortly after, after his son died. Wow. wow. There you go, honey. <laughs> huh? Oh, Cher. Sonny and Cher? God ministers seed to you, and it becomes your bread, but it also is the seed for somebody else. I, I just might as well go ahead and say this. I had intended to go this direction, but this is the way I'm going. When you see these people on television, and you see all the wickedness and the, and the, the vileness of their lives, 
cast your face down and frown and curse them in your own way and rebuke them. Say, Jesus, minister to them. Amen. Save them. Save them. Does anybody remember what my subject is? What is it? Oh, 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 yeah, yeah. Being fruitful in your maturity. See, the mature Christian understands that the seed is not for the moment, but it's for another time at another place for another person. That's God is not a God of waste. He never wastes anything, does he, George? Never. So we are to mature in Christ in our, in our fruitfulness. Paul wrote to the church of Ephesus, but speaking the truth in love, we may grow up into Him in all things which is the head, even Christ. We are to mature in love. We are to mature in our perfection walking in Him. We are to mature in the Word of God. We are to mature in His his characteristics and His grace and His mercy. All of these things come, in my humble opinion, from building up yourselves in your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit. Amen. If you are on a daily basis praying in the Spirit, you are maturing yourself in God. I believe. Joyce, I'm through. I'm through. There's one thing I, I have always failed at, according to my hermeneutic teachers. And that's how to end. When you're afraid, you're afraid. Yeah, you, you, you're supposed to have a big ending. And I've never learned how to do that. I just say what is on my heart to say and I'm through. Ladies and gentlemen, building up. Present participle on a continual basis. Building up yourselves on your most holy faith. Pray in the Holy Ghost. Amen. Yeah. And in that maturing process, God will pl place seed into your life which you are to seed into somebody else. Yeah. Hello? Yeah. Simple message. I'm, I, I am to stand with you. Yeah.